This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetacy. I'm Bridget Fetacy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. This week, our sponsors are Calm and Ritual. Walk-ins Welcome is excited to partner with Calm, the number one app for sleep, meditation, and relaxation. For a limited time, Walk-ins Welcome listeners can get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash walk-in. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash w-a-l-k-i-n it includes unlimited access to all of com's amazing content that will have you drifting off to dreamland in no time ritual is the obsessively researched vitamin for women better health doesn't happen overnight and right now ritual is offering my listeners 10 percent off during your first three months Fill in the gaps in your diet with Essential for Women, a small step that helps support a healthy foundation for your body. Visit ritual.com slash walk-in to start your ritual today. That's 10% off during your first three months at ritual.com slash walk-in. This week, I'm really excited to have Marshall Herskovitz on the podcast. I'm a little starstruck. He's an American film director, writer, and producer. Among his productions are Traffic, The Last Samurai, Blood Diamond, and I Am Sam. Herskovitz has directed two feature films, Jack the Bear and Dangerous Beauty, the movie that has inspired my life. Herskovitz was a creator and executive producer of the television shows 30-something, My So-Called Life, and Once and Again, and also wrote and directed several episodes of all three series. He's an environmental activist. He is very involved in the Democratic National Party, and he's an all-around great guy, and I'm so grateful that he came and sat down with me. We had a great talk. His story's incredible. He's a bold man. With Marshall Herskovitz, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I'm surprised you came because I could have been like a crazy fangirl, which I am. I'm just not crazy, but I am a huge fangirl. You're oh, brave. Oh, no. I I am your biggest Twitter fan. Oh, yeah, right. I am. <laughs> I'm bananas. I, am. I I'm... think you're hysterically funny and <laughs> Thank you say you. great things. And so... I'm a little bananas. Well, Sometimes What's people are like, I hate some of the things you say. I'm like, so do I. <laughs> that makes two of us. I don't even agree with me but, all the time. But you're honest about it. See, a lot of people aren't. And that's what bugs me. Yeah. I love, you're just right out there. It's like, I get what you're doing whenever you say what you say. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thank you. So tell us who you are a little bit. Okay. Who am I? That's a very good question. I'm a Philadelphia boy. Okay. And I... Uh, went to Brandeis University okay, and decided there that I wanted to make movies mm -hmm. and came to Hollywood after that. How old were you? I was 23 years old. Okay. And I couldn't get anybody to even look at anything I had done or whatever. I couldn't get a job. I was dead in the water. <laughs> upon arrival. Upon arrival, <laughs> yes. And I... Heard about this really cool film school called the American Film Institute, mm -hmm. which at that time was in this big mansion in Beverly Hills, and everybody ran around doing projects. And I thought, well, that sounds like fun. And so this is how the world has changed since then and now. So Wait, when was this? Are we allowed? Do I have to say? It was no, 19, we don't. <laughs> it was 1975. Okay. It was a long fucking time That's ago. That's crazy. Okay. So I call them up and I say, I'd like to apply. And this is the admissions director who says, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, we just finished our admissions last week for this year. You're going to have to wait a year. Uh, and I went, oh. And there must have been something in my voice. But this is how the world is different. <laughs> There's this silence. And she goes, oh, what the hell? Come on over. <laughs> oh, that is different. Yeah. So I went over and I applied. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that was a life-changing experience. The and school. Oh, my God. Amazing film school. Was it? Amazing teachers. Also, I met the guy I've worked with 
ever since then, Ed Zwick. Oh, okay. The first day, we were both directing students there. Oh, wow. And we became best friends, and that's why we, we're actually the longest living partnership in Hollywood. Right are now. you? Yes. Yeah, we are. I love you both. So, uh, so it was an amazing experience, and I could go on and on about all the stuff I learned. And then I got out of there and kind of floundered for a while. Mm -hmm. I did work. I was sort of doing freelance writing for television, which barely exists anymore. Very, I don't think anybody's freelance. No, anymore, I don't think you can get you, freelance. You, yeah, you could do it then, but it was horrible. Right. Because I wasn't using my own voice. And so finally, about three years after I got out, I said to myself, I would rather fail and just leave this business than keep doing something that doesn't feel like me. Mm -hmm. And so I sat down and I wrote an original screenplay. I didn't work for six months and just completely ran out of money and bet everything on that wow. screenplay. And the interesting thing is screenplay never sold. <laughs> it almost got made three times, but it's never sold. But nevertheless, it was the calling card that I had mm. that got me work. And everything changed because of that screenplay. Oh, wow. So I bet on myself and I won. That's you know? that's what my grandmother always said. She hated gambling. And she said, if you're going to gamble on anything, bet on yourself. There you go. And yeah. I have. And go. I went bankrupt because of it <laughs> once. But oh, I still I still rise. You have to. You yeah. have to. You have to. Yep. I yeah. learned a lot. Yeah. So, so what was the first project that you worked on? So wh what was your entry my real entry into the business was this really weird TV movie that Ed Zwick and I did in the early 80s called Special Bulletin. And it was done as if it was a live news broadcast. It was done on tape. And it literally, we created a fake network. And in the first 10 seconds, we broke in and we said, the following is a special bulletin from RBS News. Mm -hmm. And you went to Charleston, South Carolina, where there was a terrorist event taking place where this group had... Tiki uh, torches. Had, <laughs> no, they, had, they had built a homemade atomic bomb uh -huh. and were threatening to explode... Tiki torches. I didn't really... <laughs> me, sorry. They were threatening to explode it unless the United States disarmed all of its nuclear weapons in the Charleston area because Charleston is a big staging area for okay. nuclear weapons and submarines and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So they were anti-nuclear terrorists who were going to... Blow explode things a, up. Terrorist, a, a nuclear bomb if they didn't get their way. Okay. But the point was that we were showing this exactly as you would see it if you were watching the news. Okay. We never went behind the scenes, nothing like that. So we make this film for NBC and we show it to NBC and the head of NBC News, who was Tom Pettit in those days, he used to be a reporter, goes insane and says, you cannot air this. <laughs> yeah, it'll cause Absolutely chaos. Better. People will think it's happening. Yeah. <laughs> People will think it's NBC News <laughs> and you can't do it. Yeah. So this huge fight erupts between Brandon Tartnikoff, who's the head of the entertainment division, and Tom Pettit, who's head of news, <laughs> that goes to their corporate headquarters in New York. And all of a sudden, it's in the news. In other words, oh, that's the hilarious. Newspaper. And on the evening news that NBC is afraid to air this TV movie because they're afraid people are going to, you know. They probably would have, though. To. So they did air it. They they came up with a, a compromise and they had 33 disclaimers running across right. the bottom over the course of an hour and a half, 33 times. It says, what you are watching is not a real event, blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And of course, by the way, in the end, Charleston blows up. We did a, we did a nuclear explosion. <laughs> and, you know, it wasn't as bad as War of the Worlds, but there were about a thousand telephone calls from panicked people in Charleston oh, wow. who basically couldn't read, uh -huh. you know, and around the country. But the point is, that literally was like being shot out of a cannon in terms of our career. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like the Emmys. And wow. We were, we were, it was just like, who the hell are these guys? We were nobodies. You know, young, you know, I was 30 years old or so. I don't wow. know what I was, but it was like, boom. It's like the modern equivalent of going viral. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly what yeah. it was. That's all you could do in those days. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we both had careers. Oh, so wow. I was writing stuff and, and starting to direct stuff, and Ed was directing. And so, you know, the truth is that led almost directly to the deal that then led to 30-something, which was the first big thing, 
you know, that most people remember us for. Okay, my so. mom was a huge 30-something Aww. fan. <laughs> and so I grew up kind of watching it uh-huh. um, just slyly and with her, and I remember her crying all the time when yeah. we were watching it. And I, I tried to recently watch it. You can't stream that anywhere. You can't stream it. No, they have DVDs, but you can't stream it. It's terrible. It's so crazy. I know, and you know why? Because we had all this original, I'm sorry, not original. We had all this music from famous artists. Uh, original meaning actual music. Right. By these famous musicians. So it's could get the for licensing rights. <laughs> and then right after that, it's like, well, wait a minute. You know, this is going to cost $50,000. Uh, so it's been almost impossible to make music deals for that. But I might have is, to buy on, the DVD. It is on DVD, yeah. So, so if you were to reboot 30-something, yes. what would it look like? Uh, I mean, imagine what a cool reboot that would be. It'd be so different. Well, our thinking is if we were going to reboot 30-something, considering it's actually 30 years ago, yeah, and they had kids, it uh, would be mostly about the kids right. who would be in their 30s now. Oh, that's interesting. And it would be a way of looking at how it's like what it's like to be in your 30s now as opposed to then, because it's very different. Oh, yeah. You know. Why don't you do that? Well... Maybe we will. You should do that. No, really. That would be amazing. And yeah. just to see, because from somebody from my, I'm 40. So uh -huh. I was probably. I'm older than you. I was probably <laughs> uh, not you much older. Yeah, I was 10. Yeah, yeah. That's I feel young. like I was like, I, when I was watching it, it was pretty. No, I mean, I remember while the show was on, I went back to my junior high school because they asked me to come back and speak. Mm -hmm. And I you know, I went up on the stage and I said, all right, raise your hand if you actually watch this show. And like two thirds of the kids raised their hands. Because of they their parents. 12 and 13. Yeah. Said, what on earth are you doing watching this show? <laughs> they all laughed, you know. Yeah. But a lot of kids watched it. I definitely, I think it was because our parents were into it. I guess. And yeah. Yeah. I I was, there was a really great article that someone recently wrote from on, in the New York Times. Did you see this? A woman oh, rewatched all of it. Oh, yes, absolutely. That, I liked that piece a lot, but she was talking about how it, it really said a lot about her her own self and her own divorce, her own parents' her divorce. Her parents' divorce, yes. And my yeah. parents got divorced. It's funny because I remember my mom crying and looking back, uh -huh. it was like two years before they got separated. Separated. Uh -huh. So I think it yes. was probably really speaking to her on, yeah. and she was probably around 30. I yeah. mean, she was, uh, no, f well, she had me when she was 25. So she was 35. Um, she was 35. Yeah. yeah, it was right, so in, was right, right, right there. In the she was in it. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I think she was definitely, you know, that kind of hope character, the, the stay at home mother who was very much present when my father came home. And uh -huh. um, she, I, but I, yeah, I definitely remember that being an emotional show for her. And then you made one of my other most formative shows, My So-Called Life. Yes. Oh, yes. I have a funny Jared Leto story. Okay. So I was, I mean, I was so obsessed with that show. My sis, I told my sister today that I was inter interviewing you and she said, oh my God, when I think if I hear about my so-called life, I think of you. That's how obsessed with the show. But I, again, what year was that? 94 we started. Okay, so I was in junior high yeah. when that show, I was yeah. that age. Yeah. And I moved every year and a half uh -huh. and wore flannel and felt oh boy. like the, and oh I was boy. not the popular girl. Uh-huh. And Jared Leto was Jared Leto. <laughs> he was just the most handsome man in the world at the time. Yep. Yep. And my friend and I were in Joshua Tree recently. She's from London. And yeah. we were in this like hippie vegan place. Yeah. And I heard someone yapping loudly about, oh, how like there's better. And I was like, this has got to be an actor or someone. And I turn around and he's standing right there. <laughs> and he's got the, I mean, his eyes are piercingly blue. They're but amazing. it's this, yeah. there's, it's funny with celebrities who have been famous that long. Yeah. You can see, I could almost feel from the depths of his soul, like, recognize me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like there's this, this like, recognize who I am. That's I could funny. feel it. That's funny. And I just rolled my eyes and walked away. And then my friend Luna was standing right behind me yeah. and I didn't tell her uh -huh. <laughs> what was going on. Uh -huh. And I just stepped back and I was like, I'm just going to watch this play out. And she turned around, same thing happened to her. And she was like, oh, 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 hello. Oh, oh, 
<laughs> and then she came after having like a total meltdown. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. She came back and she said, did I play it cool? <laughs> And I was just dying laughing. Oh. And she's like, you can't. I can't believe you didn't tell me you were standing right there. It's just too perfect. I know. By the way, I have a funny Brad Pitt story. Oh, since I'm trying to make Brad Pitt great again. <laughs> From when when we were still doing 30-something, mm-hmm. yeah, I think it was the third year, uh, we hired Brad to play the boyfriend of a babysitter. Oh, wow. And he had just arrived in Hollywood, completely unknown, and like out of Nebraska line. or wherever he's from? Yeah, something yeah. like that. And he had one line, and it wasn't even a word. It was, hey. <laughs> you know, it was basically, you know, Michael Stedman says hello to him, and he goes, huh, like that, right? <laughs> that was his line. Okay. So he was so beautiful that when he showed up the day to work. <laughs> he must have been like 20. He was, I don't know, what, 24. Yeah, just a babe. Some, something like that. Our entire production <laughs> office, every single woman just left. Got pregnant. They just left. Yeah. <laughs> they left. In other words, <laughs> the offices were emptied out and they all went down to the set because everyone was saying, you have to come down here and see this is the most beautiful man that anyone's ever seen. That is hilarious. Literally, everyone left. He, he is gorgeous. He was amazing. Oh, and back then. Oh. By the way, just a lovely, lovely guy. He seems like it. Just a great guy. Yeah. yeah. He seems just really, he yeah. has that Midwestern no, he vibe. Does. He does. Just a great guy. Yeah. So. And it's it's hard, I think, to maintain that with fame that long, oh, when you've yeah. been fame. Yeah. And that's the weird thing about getting older is, you know, Madonna's yeah. child. I'm like, I remember when Madonna was single. And now she has <laughs> children and they're like teenagers. I know, I, it I makes know, the passage of time very. I know. So what inspired these two kind of iconic of their time shows that feel so, I was rewatching My So-Called Life and it's still so relevant. Well, the thing about My So-Called Life is, first of all, that was Winnie Holtzman's show. Mm. In other words, we were there to help her make that thing real. Right. It came about because Winnie had worked with us on 30 something. Okay. And we just loved her and we sat down and we said, let's do something together. Okay, what do we like? And I said that I had done a show, I had written a pilot for Showtime that was called Secret 17, and it was about a teenage boy. Mm -hmm. It had never been made because they changed, you know, executives and blah, blah, blah. But I had loved writing this thing, and and I felt I had a different way of looking at teenagers, sort of from the inside, as opposed to exploitatively from the outside. And... I mentioned that, and Winnie said, yes, I've always wanted to do something about teenagers. I said, okay, let's do that. So we just kind of like, we're kind of racking our brains. Well, what does that mean? How do you do that? And she went home, and she just wrote these sort of diary entries Mm. of what Angela Chase might say to her diary. How did she she know? Oh, my God. Because she, her, Winnie, I have to say, Winnie is so brilliant, but her sense memory of teen years it's incredible. Beyond belief. Oh, it's like incredible. Remembering remembering the wax paper that yep. teachers used to wrap their sandwiches. And the, like she remembered every physical moment of what it was to be in high school. So mm-hmm. at any rate, she wrote these diary entries and we read them and we went, That's the show. Right. That's just the show. And by the way, basically verbatim. Those diary entries are the voiceover of the pilot. She just, that's the first thing she did was that. And then we sort of found a story to sort of go with it. But it was all about the voice. God, it's, I, I've been rewatching it and it is incredible how much she nailed teenagehood. And even the adults, the parents, yeah. they were so yeah. real. The characters in that show were, so, I even now with all of the peak TV and everything, I'm like nothing <laughs> compares to my so-called life. We, did you did you know it was gonna, was it surprising when it was like this f- phenomenon? Well, first of all, you have to understand it failed on ABC. I remember, I do. They, <laughs> they, they, they killed it slowly. Ugh. It took three years to do 19 episodes. They would <laughs> order six, and then they would order three, and then they would order six more, and it was just, it was torture. Mm. But, you know, so 
we didn't feel that the show was succeeding. We weren't happy with how they were marketing it because we kept telling them, you're selling this as it's as if it's for teenagers. It's actually for grownups. It's for everybody. You right. know? But they didn't know how to market it. So we just felt proud of what we were doing. We didn't, it was not a success right. when it came out. But w- that wasn't yeah. it when it went on MTV? Then it went on MTV. Right. That was after it was canceled. And right. All of a sudden, everybody discovered it. Right. You know, here's the thing. They did a DVD release about, I don't know, seven, eight, six, seven years ago. I can't mm-hmm. remember when. Shout Factory did it. Mm-hmm. And they wanted us to come in and do commentary. Oh, okay. So Winnie and I and Scott Winant, who directed the pilot and was one of our producers, went in and we're watching the pilot and doing commentary. And by the end of the pilot, the three of us are sitting there sobbing, <laughs> sobbing. And the engineer says, you have to talk. And we go, we can't talk. And the reason we were sobbing was because it was so pure. Yeah. We forgot. It was so was pure. The, the, the pressure on you in this business is so in, insidious. Mm-hmm. That we didn't even realize that in the intervening 20, 25 years, how we had been influenced by the constant pressure. You know, well, what about this and the audience that and blah, blah, blah. And this thing was just what it was. Mm-hmm. And it was just, I look back on it, that's what I'm most proud of mm-hmm. is that we just did this thing that was only what it was. It wasn't trying to be something for everybody. And mm-hmm. It wasn't pulling its punches. It was just what it was. I, I think that's what my cousin, who's my writing partner, and she's my podcast partner as well, um, cousin Maggie and my Twitter person when I'm off for Lent, she uh, and I have been rewatching it and oh. we were both bawling at the end of the pilot. And oh. it's just so, it, we said the exact same thing. It's so pure. It was a different time, but that there's something about that that it's just, it was so pure. There, was, it, there didn't seem to be anyone. I'm glad to hear that the way that it feels is what it actually was. Yeah, it was and it was a... Oh, the actors were great. It's so funny. We were we were terrified of Claire. She was thirteen when she started. She's terrifying. We were terrified. <laughs> yeah, we, I did not know how to talk to her. Yeah, because she was like like a fifty year old unearthly child. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and half the things she would be very quiet, and half the things that she would say sounded like a thirteen year old. Yeah, and the other half were like, "Where did she come from?" <laughs> you know, I remember, I directed the third episode. Mm-hmm. And there was a moment where I realized I had to give her direction uh-huh. because she, there was something just slightly off, you know. And I was like scared to give her direction <laughs> because you just knew she was a genius. Yeah. We knew she was a genius from the first moment she walked into the, the audition. Yeah. She it was is just a genius. Like right there. So she's so good. Yeah, she she's amazing. good in those silent moments, too. She's incredible. And she, yeah. that character, I mean, I'll never, I, she was the person who, I felt so alone in those years. And it, again, it was a tumultuous time. Yeah. And it really, it was that show, I think, that I connected to so deeply that like saved my life in a weird oh. way. Because By the way, my, my favorite episode is the one we called The Zit. Mm. Because, and this was Winnie. This was pure Winnie. She has them quoting Kafka's Metamorphosis. <laughs> you know, yep. waking up and finding out you're a cockroach. And you know, racial discrimination and having a zit on your face and seeing the commonality among all of that. Mm-hmm. And only Winnie could pull that off. Uh, you know, just the fact that everybody feels like a complete outsider and a freak. Yeah. And and making that beautiful. It was just, that was just as a piece of writing, so astonishing. It just, I, it's, I, I wonder too. I was thinking about that. What would I? Not that you ever could do it again, but what would a reboot of that look like? Oh boy, I don't know. <laughs> it would be crazy. I don't know. But, I mean, kids have to deal with so much today. It's just. I did um a roundtable with a bunch of teens yeah. for the podcast yeah. and about technology, yeah. spe- uh, just specifically their use. Yeah. Ten to eighteen years old, and yeah. I'm telling you, these Gen Z, the Gen Z kids are hilarious, yeah, and fascinating. Yeah, they are. They're just they are. They're because really cool. they, I don't, yeah, they just have to. They grew up online in some ways, yeah, and yeah. were exposed to basically everything. My yeah. my sister was saying she's like, my kids have been exposed to everything. I just assume they've seen everything, yeah, and yeah. they, I have to provide them values 
And I feel like I have basically until she says like 13, 14. Yeah. And then it's and then they're they're off. I mean, they're not gone. You can still reinforce it. But that's when they start, you know, obviously looking outward. And there's so much. I know. I know. But they weirdly can't get in as much trouble because they have like tracking devices on them all the time. I would have been probably better off having a tracking device. (laughs) 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 <laughs> they don't seem to find their you know they they would rather be tracked than give up their phone uh, so <laughs> this i don't is, know it is true they are there's all these studies there's this famous study from maine i think about this town where they talked about the diameter of miles that a kid was free to roam back in i think 1968 right versus the diameter now ah. and it was like 20 square miles then and it's like 0.4 square miles oh now. wow and weird and the amazing thing is that most of the parents of the kids now were the kids then right in other words it's just everyone sees the world as so dangerous now even though it's actually no safer. more dangerous than it was <laughs> yeah it's actually yeah, it's, safer it's actually safer yeah but everyone perceives the risk as so great that they just you know they just can't let their children go there's a great actually chapter in that book mediated sitting right there that uh-huh. i pretty much read every year uh-huh. uh he wrote it in 2006 and it's all and one of it is justin's helmet theory one of the chapters and it's all about exactly this uh-huh. why you know when we were kids we didn't ride with helmets now right. it's unthinkable to to right. not ride right. your bike with that and if right. you have ways to protect your kids obviously you would want to right but then there's the sense that things get around faster yeah because it, now we have amber alert so yeah. it, we there's this perception that you know a kidnapping might yeah. happen more often than it does just yeah. because everybody hears about it now and before, there probably were more kidnappings, but the only way we found out about it was like a milk carton. I know. It's really how we define risk. Milk cartons were the original Amber, <laughs> amber Alerts. <laughs> exactly. You know, but, but how we define risk is actually so destructive, mm-hmm. you know, in ways that people don't really understand. That's interesting. You need to be able to face risk in your life. Definitely. And, and children are not taught to face, face risk. So... You know, there are these unintended consequences mm-hmm. uh, that come from that. Yep. So. Do you have kids? I have two kids, yes. And are they, how old are they? Ancient. Ancient? 36 and 32. Okay, that's not ancient, sir. Well, to me, that is. <laughs> are you calling me ancient? <laughs> when they're your kids, they're ancient. <laughs> yes, yes. My dad, when I turned 40 this year, yeah, my yeah. dad was like, I can't believe you're 40. It's like, way to make this about you, dad. Yep. It's all about how he I'll, could. I'll be right with him. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I can't believe it. Uh-huh. I'm so old. I'm like, you're yeah. not old, but this is my birthday. <laughs> I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Are you struggling to sleep these days? You're not alone. One in three U.S. adults doesn't get enough sleep. And if you're not sleeping enough, it can affect your cognitive functions during the day, like learning, problem solving, and decision making. Did you know that a good night's sleep is like a magic remedy for the brain and body? When we sleep well, we're more focused and relaxed, and best of all, sleep makes us happier. And that's why we're partnering with Calm, the number one app for sleep. Sleep deficiency does serious damage, not just to your brain, but to your body as well. The sleepless are more prone to accidents, weight gain, and depression. With Calm, you'll discover a whole library of programs designed to help you get the sleep your brain and body needs, like soundscapes and over 100 sleep stories narrated by soothing voices like Jerome Flynn from Game of Thrones and Stephen Fry. So if you want to seize the day, sleep the night with the help of Calm. I definitely have struggled with insomnia my whole life. I have a racing mind. The Calm app is the best way for you to get to sleep if you're having a hard time. I love the body scans, which I'm a huge fan of, where it takes you through a meditation through your body where you'll just focus on your little toe, focus on your second toe. I basically never make it past my ankle before I'm passed out. I really can't say enough good things about it right now. Walk-ins welcome listeners get 25% off Calm Premium subscription at calm.com slash walk-in. That's C-A-L-M dot C-O-M 
slash walk in. 40 million people have downloaded Calm. Find out why at calm.com slash walk in. So you also directed yes. my <laughs> favorite movie ever, Dangerous Beauty. Well, that was my favorite experience Ugh. in this business. So I was, my, I, my sister and I were joking about this today. She's like, the fact that we were allowed to watch that as formative young children is uh -huh. <laughs> a little weird, but we, my mom loved it and uh -huh. I grew up kind of watching it and it, I, it definitely, when people ask me about the, the, the movie that probably most formed my psyche, it's, it is Dangerous Beauty. Uh -oh. And there's this one quote in it, love, love, man, love, love, don't love the man when you love the man you lose. Yes. And I'm like, there <laughs> might be a reason I'm still single at <laughs> 40 years old. Uh -oh. And it could be Dangerous Beauty. Uh -oh. But I just loved how it was such an interest. I have the biography that, because uh -huh. it, uh -huh. it was based... For yeah. most people don't know about this movie, so right, give us a little rundown of it. Well, it's funny. Um, uh, the person who was doing development for us and our co-producer at the time, a woman named Sarah Kaplan, mm -hmm. came into my office one day, said, we just got this book, basically the most famous prostitute in Venice in the 1500s is also the most famous poet in Venice. She's put on trial by the Inquisition and she gets off. It's amazing. It's an and amazing I, story. And I said, okay, I'll make that movie. Yeah. I'm on, I'm on board. Yeah. That was it, you know. And we got the rights to the book. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, developed the script. And uh, it, was, it was sort of an amazing process. But for me, it was a very political statement. I mean, this was very much sort of at the heart of how I look at human relations mm -hmm. and sexuality mm -hmm. and especially, you know, what has happened to women in Western culture. Mm -hmm. In many ways, I felt I made that movie for my daughters. Interesting. Yeah, it was really a testament for them to see what I believe about sort of what a woman's prerogative should be in our culture as opposed to what the culture has demanded of women. So can you elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that it, it was a parable, even though it's a true story, mm -hmm. I saw it as a parable, mm -hmm. which is to say, you have to take an extreme situation like that, where at that time, if you were a quote unquote, regular woman, or one of the aristocracy, you were kept in a cage right you, there's that great line where she talks about the yeah. the permanent state of nothingness yes, or in, in yes. being inconsequential in, in, inconsequential mm -hmm. they didn't even know how to read mm -hmm. okay. they weren't allowed to go in libraries and right yeah right whereas if you were a courtesan mm -hmm. you had to be an artist of some kind mm -hmm. that was that was essential you had to sing dance write be a poet you know um be a painter any kind of thing you had enormous influence over men. Mm -hmm. And they were actually, to a certain extent, sexually free. In mm -hmm. other words, as opposed to other sex workers at different times, they chose their lovers. Right. But they had to do that. In other words, that was the price they paid to have freedom as a woman was they had to be sexual beings. Right. But they chose how to do that, the time and the place, that sort of thing. Right. And they were also subject to some pretty terrible consequences if men got mad at them. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying it was a good life for them. Right. But it was an interesting trade-off to look at. Right. At that time. Right. That And, and my whole point, especially then, because things have changed so quickly. I mean, that movie came out 21 years ago. Mm -hmm. And... Sexual politics in America have changed so quickly since then. Mm -hmm. But at that time, we were still kind of in, I forget which wave of feminism it was, but it was sort of the wave of feminism that said that if a woman is going to be taken seriously, then she can't advertise her sexuality. Right. I forget which wave that was, first or second wave, you know. But it was basically, you know, you had to be buttoned down and you had to sort of you know, not be ostentatious, not be seductive, you know, if you're going to be taken seriously as a woman. Mm -hmm. And I always thought, well, that's crap. Yeah. That's bullshit. I've been, you know, I've been raging against this 
Well, my entire life online and life. No, I can understand. Yeah, I, I get it. And I just thought, you know, this was a way of of sort of insidiously undermining that. And saying, well. hey, wait a minute, you know. <laughs> You, you planted the seed in the right person. <laughs> <laughs> you can't put a person in a box. Yeah. You know, I'm not kidding. Is this is person. the most influential movie. And in it's like now that I'm hearing the insidious politics behind this, yeah. I'm like, oh, my God, that really did get in my head. Well, and by the way, you know, the movie absolutely bombed mm -hmm. when it came out and has had this incredible life afterwards. It's like a cult film. Yeah. There are. I still hear about the film from people at least once a month, mm -hmm. even now. Mm -hmm. And people teach it in courses. And because, oh, that's such a beautiful because film. It's because it's making a very clear statement about something. Mm -hmm. It's I just loved the the it's beautiful, visually beautiful. She's gorgeous. She's gorgeous. The yes. most gorgeous woman was, maybe on earth. Yes, and and a total just a doll. What's her? Is it Cat Cat Catherine McCormick? Catherine McCormick. Yeah, oh. She was just. Absolutely, uh, and 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 by the way, at that time, like the way she dressed in her real life mm -hmm. was like combat boots and her hair all over the place, and just sort of like like the opposite of the what you saw. In, oh, right. In the movie, she was know? like in the grunge phase. Yeah, totally yeah. Grunge, total <laughs> English actor grunge. You That's know? hilarious. And um, and by the way, they had to teach her. It's like, no, you have to stand up straight. You have to move like this. And, mm. you know, it was not easy for her because it was not her way. Right. But she completely embraced it. it oh, was, she was amazing. Well, yeah. she has that whole montage where she's learning. So yeah. that probably helped yeah. her. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That was so much fun. Oh, it must have been so fun to direct. And by the way, living in Rome for six months right. was just so was, So happy. you filmed it in Rome? We filmed it in Rome okay. at the Cinecittà Studios. Mm -hmm. And we did three days in Venice. Okay. The rest of it was in Rome. Mm -hmm. We actually built two canals. In, in They have a tank there. Oh, wow. And so we built two canals. And so almost everything in that film was done on the back lot. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And it was... I don't know if you've ever spent any time in Italy. Oh, I love Rome. Oh my God, it was so great. I want to go back. It was so great. They I, are just, they just, they love life. Yeah, they do. They love life. They, they live do. life every day. Mm -hmm. And it was, it somehow infused the movie mm -hmm. because we were all having that experience that, that there's a joyfulness that we, that somehow in America is very hard to, hold on to or to you know it's it just there's so much stress here mm -hmm. and also anger in other words so much anger yeah i like one of the things i noticed right away was people are not angry there mm -hmm. you know although it's funny they seem like they're angry often right like i remember once uh we were we went to this restaurant <laughs> And there were four it's Americans. It's just the way they are. Four Americans and one Italian. We had a reservation. We go in and the Italian says to the receptionist, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And they start screaming at each other. <laughs> and then the owner comes out and, and our friend and the owner start screaming at each other. I mean, screaming right. at each other, right? You know, and finally he goes, oh, like that. And he throws up his hands and he walks away. And we're like dying. And we go, what was that? And she says, he was so embarrassed that they forgot they lost the reservation that he couldn't stop apologizing. Oh, and that's, that's literally so funny. what had taken place. And we thought they had a huge fight. Yeah. yeah. I used to think that actually about my cousin. I have a German cousin <laughs> because my dad's one of 10 and she would come yeah. visit us in the summers yeah. and she would be speaking with her mom. And yeah. I was, and it sounds so hostile and the language <laughs> is so hard. And I'm like, oh my God, did you guys get in a fight? She said, no, I just said I loved her and I missed her and I can't wait to see her. I'm there like, wow, I never would have guessed that. There and, you go. Exactly. But yeah, the same with, I, I feel like I grew up with a, my mom really idealized the the European way of life. Yes. And she spent time in Europe when she was young and she, I think if she had had it her way, she probably would have raised us all in Europe. Right. She just right. was almost borderline anti-American. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my dad is so Irish Catholic from the East Coast, so American. My grandfather fought, his father fought in World War II, right. was extremely patriotic. So right. I was raised with, an, I feel like a very... Yeah 
healthy balance polarized yeah but yes. it and they were very different people but yeah. um he's extremely rational and she's extremely passionate she's uh-huh. french and italian there you go and my dad's you know irish right. and mostly some german and whatever I'm most, a Ir- most irish people i've known are the most passionate people they're passionate but, but he it's, it's, we had some yeah. like he my dad being i think probably one of 10 and falling in the birth order where he did yeah. which was second yeah he just was very calm. He's like the calm, calm everyone called him perfect yeah. Pete. And <laughs> he's, so he, I got some calm genes from him. Yeah. Thank goodness <laughs> that balance things out. But th- I feel yeah. like I had a healthy mix of, you know, proper worldly skepticism right. and also healthy appreciation for the country that I live in. Right. And right. she was the thing that we were raised to, really have we she grew up she raised us to have a deep appreciation for the arts and just life living life right. and she always used to remind us um she's still alive i'm talking about her like she's dead but she's still <laughs> alive um but she would remind us a lot that you know to to not get lost in the workaholism that yeah. is so prevalent in the united states it's great and so I, I do feel really grateful. I mean, we grew up going to museums and stu- yep. studying the arts and me being the old, I'm the oldest of five. Oh, wow. So me, wow. I got probably, and yes. being born in New York, I probably yeah. got exposed to the most of it right. since I was an only child for a minute. Right. And then I peaked as a baby act. I was a, I was an infant star <laughs> and I peaked <laughs> and I've been chasing that high ever since. And then were, when, were you a star? I was a Huggies model and a oh, Sears God. model. Oh my God. I always am like, I could have been Natalie Portman if those if all go. my siblings didn't come along and we moved to Minnesota. <laughs> no, at all. I love my siblings. But yeah, I was oh. I was on that path. Right. And it's funny because then I moved out here when I was nineteen to be an actress. Right. And I started and I always wrote. Yeah. And I realized that you could do that for a living. I didn't know why it didn't occur to me. To, uh-huh. It was like breathing, so yeah. I never thought, hey, yeah. you can do this too. <laughs> yeah. And I hated yeah. driving around and begging. Yes. It's such a hard oh, it's industry. A it's life. such Being a... an actor is a horrible life. Oh my God. Yeah. I I yeah. pretty quickly realized that I don't think I have what it takes. Right. right. And you have no control. That's the thing. That's why it's horrible. Yeah. You have no control. My friend who I came out here with when I was 19, he's still doing it and hustling yeah. and he's yeah. amazing. Yeah. But... My gosh, I've watched him grind it out for 20 years and it's like living off one commercial for a year and then not an Ubering and it's just... Most of my friends who are actors eventually became writers, directors, producers Mm -hmm. in addition to being actors or just gave up acting because they just... If you grow up, if you're an actor and you're a grown up, right? You, you reach a point where you can't stand that lack of control, and so oh, you yeah. have to somehow try to take arms against the, you know, a the power universe. Yeah. <laughs> so, what's the hardest project you've ever done? The hardest project mm-hmm. I've ever done. Oh, okay. The hardest project I've ever done was the first film I directed. It was called Jack the Bear. Okay. And um, it was. It, I was coming right off of thirty something, mm-hmm. and it was from that was a, four seasons, thirty yes, something. That was four okay, seasons, yes. And Jack the Bear was from a f- pretty famous novel and set in Oakland, California, in I think nineteen seventy two. Mm-hmm. And um, when I got the job to direct it, there was already a script, and Danny DeVito was already attached as the star, and Danny had script approval in his contract and i love the script that's why i wanted to do it but i thought it had structural problems like basically on page 60 you still didn't know what the movie was about. (laughs) yeah it's not not a good sign (laughs) and so there was a lot of fighting before we started shooting about the script Mm. because i just kept saying guys this is going to be a mess and danny disagreed with me Mm. And and Steve Zalian had written the script, who's a genius. I mean, he's a brilliant, brilliant writer. But I still felt there were structural problems. And finally, I remember Danny and I got into this fight where we were yelling at each other. And he said to me, he said, look, when we're shooting, 
You're the director. You tell me to go there, I go there. You tell me to say that, I say that. But we're not shooting right now. We're talking about the script. It was mm -hmm. this very interesting moment mm -hmm. where he was being really straight, you know, and he was sort of speaking to my insecurities. This was my first time directing and that sort of thing. But I realized I was not going to win mm. this battle over the script. And I should either quit before we start shooting or make the movie and hope I could fix it in the editing room. And uh, it was one of the few times Ed Zwick gave me bad advice. <laughs> <laughs> because I had actually, just before that, I was going to do a movie of Robin Hood. Uh, I was actually in England scouting locations, and it turned out there were three other Robin Hood projects, and one of them was the Kevin Costner right. one, and we were blown out of the water, and our movie didn't get made. And Ed said to me, I don't think you want to have your second movie not happen. You know? Right. He said, I think you should stick it out. So in retrospect, I'm not sure that was the right decision, mm. but I did stick it out. And I filmed a script that I knew from a structural standpoint did not work. Mm -hmm. So then, and by the way, Danny was true to his word. He was like amazing right? You know, well, during shooting, okay? Then we come to editing and the movie doesn't work as I predicted. Right. And the studio is like shocked. It's like, well, you don't know what's happening. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, so we spent one year editing oh, that film. Oh, yikes. I mean, most films don't even don't take much less than a year to do all of post-production. Right. You know, editing maybe takes three months, you know, mm -hmm. one year editing. <laughs> they tried to fire my editor, who was a brilliant guy who w went to film school with, you know, and f it was just such a miserable experience mm. in post-production where I thought I was going to be fired off the film. Mm -hmm. And finally, we kind of, we kind of did what we needed to do to make the film work. And, um, but you know, it's one of those films, some people love it, some people, it's just nobody ever saw it. Right. I mean, it just, it was a very, very painful experience. And did you learn a lot from it? What was the biggest lesson you learned oh, from the it? Only, the only lessons I learned were political lessons. Basically, don't give up control. Right. That was it. In other words, from a filmmaking standpoint. And trust standpoint, your gut. <laughs> trust your gut. Right. Yes. From a filmmaking standpoint, I'm very proud of it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it's, and I, you know, there were things I did in that that I look at now and I go, wow, you know, and it was all about kids and the mm -hmm. kids were great. The, the lead kid was great. You know, it's just, um, it was just a very painful experience because of all the stuff around it. That's all. I think I heard that James Cameron's first movie that he was directing was so stressful that he was having nightmares. And in one of the dreams, one of the studio heads came from the future and oh, assassinated no, come on, him. Come on. And that's what gave him the idea for oh Terminator. God. Oh my God. This is, I've, I could be wrong, but I feel like I read this somewhere that that's how he got that the idea be, for a script was he was under so much pressure. Wow. Wouldn't yeah, surprise me. Yeah. Um, it seems like directing a movie is an enormous amount of pressure from so many directions and you're juggling so many different personality types. And ugh. I gave up directing movies after uh, Dangerous Beauty. Oh, okay. I directed two movies and I said, I can't Not for do you. this anymore. So you produce primarily now. I produce and I write. Okay. And I still direct. I'll direct television, but I can't do 75 days. Yeah. It's, it's a... I feel like I'm in jail. Yeah. It's a, it's a, like a claustrophobia mm -hmm. feeling because the stress is so high. And I'm one of those people, I mean, I guess if you were to diagnose me, I probably have generalized anxiety disorder. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm one of those people that needs a lot of time to sort of process yeah. what's going on so that I can sort of move Function. on. To yeah. The next <laughs> Function, yeah. Function, exactly. And when you're directing, basically 18 hours a day, you are there and you must be functioning completely at your best. And then you get back to your hotel room and you must fall asleep immediately and, and stay asleep for the six hours you're going to get until you wake up and do it again in the morning. I mean, that's like, bananas. I can't do it. I yeah. just can't do it. So it was a very strange thing for me in my life because since I was a junior in college, all I wanted to do was be a movie director. Wow. And then after making two movies, I said, this is going to kill me. Mm. You know, and I love directing, but I hate that process. I remember saying to somebody, <laughs> if I could have it in my contract 
that I could have three sick days over the course <laughs> of a 75-day shoot, I could be fine. Right. And I probably wouldn't even use them just right. knowing. Right, right. It's like a I safety could just blanket. call it, you yeah. know. Um, but, you know, that would be, that would cost them a million dollars. Yeah. So you're not going to get that. No, I, I, I had a young, I dated a young actor who had been in the business for a while when I was 19. And he said something I never forgot. And it's still, as I've lived out here for almost 15 years now, yeah. he said, um, you're only as good as your last project in this town. Yeah. And yeah. it's so true. I've seen it happen to friend after friend after oh, yeah. friend. Yeah. I mean, you can have one project and yeah. if you put all your eggs in that basket and write and direct and pre- yeah. and then it doesn't do well, yeah. a studio won't take a risk on you again. I know. And yeah. it's unfortunate. I and know. then you have to reinvent yourself and people, people obviously do. make comebacks. They do. They and do. it's not yeah. like the end of the world. But I mean, yeah. you want to talk about resilient. Yeah. It, it, this is a business that absolutely demands resiliency, especially yeah. when... It really, and the other thing you said was right face, right place, right time. It's yeah. really like all it is for yeah. actors and actresses in particular. Yeah, but you have to be, I mean, when I think of the horrible things that have happened to both Ed and me over the years, and the fact that we would pick ourselves up and do it again after being betrayed and lied to and having things shut down and, and you know, it's just amazing like how passionate you have to be yeah. to do this. And it always makes me laugh or it makes me mad the way people talk about Hollywood. They think of Hollywood as being cynical. Mm-hmm. And you cannot make a movie cynically. No. It's too hard. <laughs> no. It's too fucking hard. Why do you think people think this? I think it's sort of baked into the whole thing about Hollywood glitz and glamour. Mm-hmm. And it goes way back to the 30s, even mm-hmm. the 20s, mm-hmm. and you know the way the way Hollywood would take serious material and make it sort of for the masses, whatever right. it was. I think it just got this sort of impression that it was fake and you know all for the glamour. And the truth is, there's no glamour in our business. The only glamour in our business is what you see on television when people go to the award shows. Right, making movies is the most unglamorous thing. In all the world. of it, all it's of it. Like so watching paint dry. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, if you're not part of it, it's you know, and people don't look glamorous. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole process is ridiculous. Actually, it's so. I got it's, to do a, a very bit role that will probably be cut out of Curb Your Enthusiasm uh-huh. because sometimes I open uh-huh. for Jeff. Yeah. Garland and I joking, you know, he he was there was just an opportunity to do a hostessing thing. I had yeah. one line, yeah, and it's so unglamorous, and the hours are crazy, and you wake yeah. up at five o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning, and then you yeah. go, and yeah. it's so much sitting around and waiting, and yeah, I don't think people realize how much downtime there is in between everyone else doing all this other stuff. And no, most people, when they visit a set, they think nothing's happening. Yeah, you know? I know. Um, and or, everyone works so hard. Everyone works so, I mean, yeah. everyone, the whole crew works enormously hard. It's really crazy. Hard. I remember one of the first meetings I had when I first came out of, of film school and I was pitching something. I was at Universal mm-hmm. and I came out of the meeting. Of course, I was terrified of this meeting and felt intimidated and whatever i i came out of the meeting and i was looking for my car and i smelled sawdust and i grew up my father had a woodworking business in north philadelphia and um that smell of sawdust from a mill you know from mill work from saws and all of that it's like it was it was very primitive to right me. it was like and i'm like like, what is that smell? Why am I smelling sawdust? And I followed the smell and I found the mill mm. at Universal where they were making the fake walls and the styrofoam bricks and all that stuff. And I remember having this epiphany at that moment that here are all these guys. Of course, it was all guys in those days. Yeah. Blue collar, just like the men who worked in my father's mm-hmm. shop. I'm sitting there thinking, this is so amazing. It's so amazing. These people come to work every day to make fake things. Yeah. And this is their job. Yeah. And it's like, what kind of a business is it? It's crazy. All we do is make fake things. (laughs) I know. Everything is fake. I know. It's like, even, even, sorry to interrupt, even that, even the experience of Curve Your Enthusiasm was I had to go to the, wait, which studio is it that I had to go to? Maybe Universal? I think it was Universal. 
But their yeah. where the wardrobe, yeah, the floor where it's just yeah. rooms and rooms yes. and costumes and costumes yeah. and costumes and costumes. Yeah, and I was like, oh my god, it is. <laughs> this is one tiny department on one studio on one yeah. lot, and yeah. it's massive. Yeah. And there's so much history. There's the downstairs. They have the amazing. It's just. It was such a cool experience, and just yeah. getting to get a like fitting for something and try a bunch of clothes on and seeing all the uniforms it was amazing and then just being on the back lot and when i first moved out here when i was 19 i did tons of extra work Uh uh-huh and i (laughs) i loved it because i got to read all day right and i was always the person who was not trying to get a voucher i was the one trying to just not be in anything and do nothing right but of course that's the person that they're like oh you look like you don't care right and so i'm pretty sure like every movie from the early or every show from the early 2000s like freaks and geeks (laughs) buffy i'm somewhere in the classroom oh everywhere i'll look for you everywhere but extra work too that's such a weird I was so glad when what's his name did that show about extras. Oh yeah, yes. um, because it is such a crazy yeah. world. Like the yes. professional extras, yeah, they're serious. I love acting, by the way. I do too. I cast myself in the things that I do. I've I've acted a, several times. I love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. It's so much fun. I weirdly yeah. I have more training in that than anything. Uh-huh. So growing up, it was what I did. I did yeah. at theater. I did, went to theater camp. I had tons of classes in improv. I I have more training in that than writing or anything else that I'm doing. Uh And it's definitely, even just being able to do that little bit role, it it reignited that like, I want this. I'm not going to give up on this. It is. It's It's so fun. It's just so much fun. And everyone's so lovely and craft services. (laughs) (laughs) I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. We all want to do the right thing to keep our bodies healthy in the long run. But even if we try really hard to eat kale salads and drink green smoothies, we're still most likely not getting all of the essential nutrients we need on a daily basis. Enter Ritual, the obsessively researched vitamin for women. Ritual's essentials have the nutrients most of us don't get enough of from food, all in their clean, absorbable forms, no shady additives or ingredients that can do more harm to your body than good. Two easy-to-take capsules provide nine nutrients you need to support a strong foundation for your health. I have been taking Ritual for about three months now, and I have noticed a big difference in my energy level, particularly that it's just more steady, and I forgot to take it for a couple of days, and my energy in the afternoon crashed, and it may or may not be the vitamin, but it was definitely a noticeable afternoon crash that I hadn't been experiencing. I like how clean the vitamin is, and I like that I know all of the ingredients in the vitamins. It is so easy to find where all of them come from, and they're so transparent about everything that's in the vitamin. I love it. I can't say enough about this vitamin. It's also really simple. You don't have to take a million. It's just two. So easy and they're delivered. Better health doesn't happen overnight, and right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Fill in the gaps in your diet with Essential for Women, a small step that helps support a healthy foundation for your body. Visit ritual.com slash walk-in to start your ritual today. That's 10% off during your first three months. It's a really great deal at ritual.com slash walk-in. So So, what are you working on now? Well, we're trying to put together several things that we're selling in television, Mm -hmm. which I shouldn't talk about. Okay, that's fine. Um, Yeah. The business has changed incredibly Mm -hmm. in the last 10 years. Really incredibly. I mean, the movie business is gone. Yeah. The movie business is, it's 100 years of incredible tradition and history is just gone. Ugh. And, you know, the studios make these tentpole films and everything else is independent and you have to kill yourself to raise the money. You never get the money back. You know, probably 500 films are made a year and six of them are anointed. Right. Get seen by anybody. Right. And um, it's just a, it's just a horrible. The movie business is horrible. Right. Um, the television business is so strange because. There are 500 scripted series on television, and yet it's harder to sell things now 
than it was back when there were three or four networks. That's interesting. It's very odd, and everyone says it. It's because every network, every entity has such a very specific target of what right. they're looking for, for their brand. Right. That it's so easy to miss it, you know. Right. Um, it's just very difficult. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's very difficult. And, you know, like how they define success, you know, you keep hearing these things like on the streaming networks, since they go by subscriptions. Right. They want something that makes noise so they get more people to subscribe. So a really successful show by its third season is not getting new subscribers. So right. they'll cancel it. Right. Even if people love it. Right. You know, so it's like, what? You know, so. I feel like that's where the networks have an opportunity well, to kind they, of pick up the shows that get canceled off the streams you after would, three you would seasons. Think, you would think. I don't really understand how the broadcast networks think. Uh, it's not. I feel I just, like they're still like 25 years behind. <laughs> I, you know, and, and if you talk to them, they claim that's the audience that they need, although their audience is no bigger now than the cable or the streaming audience. It used to be there was a huge difference. There's so much content. I mean, yeah, yeah. I discover new, yeah. there's just so much content. It, yeah. It's crazy. And it is great because you can kind of find something for everyone. Kind of. <laughs> but some things just don't hit. I mean, there was yeah. there was um this show. There's just so much good stuff, I think, that falls through the cracks that is amazing. Yeah, yeah. And yes, I mean, we did an online show in 2007 that then was bought by NBC mm -hmm. and completely bombed on NBC mm -hmm. because it should have been on cable. Right. Because in those days, you had to have a much bigger audience on a network than on cable. And our first night, we had 3.7 million viewers. Wow. Which, by the way, today would be great. That's amazing. For anybody. Yeah. But it was a disaster for NBC, but would have been a grand slam home run if it had been on any cable show, Oh wow. On network. So, you know, but that was 2007 when we were, they were just sort of figuring that out. Right. That, that, you know, that because the numbers are so different, that means the the content has to be different. Right. I remember I figured it out before we aired because our show was called Quarter Life and it was about a bunch of people in their 20s. I love that show. Of well, course I love that show. <laughs> well, the point was I realized this is not going to do well on NBC. No, I no. watched it. Oh, there you go. Yeah, Thank I you. loved it. And Thank then you. didn't it get moved to... No, it started on MySpace. That's where I watched it. Started it started on MySpace. Yeah. And then it went to NBC... But NBC only showed it once. and then I we, watched it on MySpace. Uh, yeah. But then we couldn't raise the money to do more. Ugh, so It's such a, and there's uh, so, you know, they keep saying, oh, it's peak content and it's done and it's done. But then, you know, Apple comes out with a new platform. And so I feel like I there seems to be an insatiable. And like you said, there, I don't think it's going to end because you need constant new stuff that's going to get subscribers excited so that that beast is never fulfilled. Here's what bugs me. Um, I have a friend who refers to narrative exhaustion. Mm. And I think that's what's starting to happen. And I think that the, you know, even now when you go into these networks, they want things that are in some way perverse because that's what's going to make noise or get people to watch them. Mm -hmm. And so it's much harder now to break through and have people sort of notice you or be moved because there's so much stuff mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think back when I was a kid and you went to the movies and you saw a movie, you had no chance to ever see that movie again. Right. Unless you went back to the theater. Right. You know, and how it would stay in your mind for years because you treasured it mm -hmm. because it wasn't available to you. People don't treasure movies now the way we treasured movies then. No. So another unintended consequence of modern life. My When my nephews were visiting, they didn't turn on the TV once. Uh -huh. It's dead. Yeah. They, were, uh, they said they 100% get all their content from YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. I feel like my this generation <laughs> is the last generation of anyone who even turns on a TV. Yeah. They just don't watch TV. Yeah. Sitting in front of a TV for them where they can't be mobile. I mean, <laughs> and it was funny because, you know, they'd be doing their things and they would just have their phone propped up watching Family Guy or whatever right, episodes right. on YouTube. Room room. Yeah. And yeah. they can be mobile and yeah. 
be doing all their other things and yeah. it's, it doesn't make sense for them to be kind of locked in a room <laughs> in front of no, television. No. And it's sad because that used to be like an experience exactly. and everybody exactly. kind of bemoaned the family sitting together watching television. And now we're looking back on that, like the good old days <laughs> and yes. that, and the people before were looking I back know. on, you know, sitting well, around talking as the I good know. old days. So we're going to, I mean, it was Frank Capra who said, the magic of movies is that you have 500 people, each one of them sitting alone in the dark for two hours watching what you're showing them. Mm -hmm. And that was the magic of it. My so, you know. No. My friend has a really brilliant insight into reaction videos. You know how there's, have you seen reaction videos on YouTube? You've probably seen them and you don't know that they're reaction videos, but they're the videos where someone will be watching, for instance, a comedian. Oh, yeah, it could yeah, be yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's somebody yes. reacting to it. Yes. Didn't and that, Didn't that start with the Red Wedding or did it start before? I don't know. I uh, would like to know. I'm uh, kind of fascinated with the whole reaction video thing uh -huh. and I should yes. research it. Yes. But he is um, uh, alone a lot. And he yeah. said, I don't know. I just like it because I watch it. And I'm like, I know, right? Am I right? And it's like this <laughs> sense that you're not watching watching something alone which oh is terribly sad oh but also it's amazing yeah i yeah. it's the same idea of a movie where yeah. you're laughing in a movie yes. and you look over to your left or right and someone's laughing with you and one of my traditions is the arrow i go to the marx brothers double f feature and um you love the marx brothers oh god i love them oh god bless you i just think they're perfect the marx, they're everything yeah perf they perfect they started everything and they, um, oh my God. they, they have the double feature on New Year's Day every year. The Arrow, Where? at and, the Arrow, really? yeah. What every, is the, what's the double feature? They do every year. They do two different oh, Marx different Brothers. Mm -hmm. How did I not know that? I have no idea, but it oh is my, my tradition. Oh my God! And they, they were everything. Oh, and I, it's so fun to see them on the big screen. Oh. Jesus. And people just get all comfy, and sometimes oh. the grandson, one of the grandsons of, um, yes. will come speak, right. and it's just so cool. Oh God! It's yeah. The Marx Brothers, li literally, they are our touchstone. Mm -hmm. It goes Marx Brothers, Woody Allen, mm -hmm. who now he's, you're uh, not allowed to canceled. talk about anymore. But sorry, he was he's a he's genius. He's a genius, yeah. You know? And uh, you know, I mean, Annie Hall, yeah is my second favorite movie of all time. My roommate, it's her favorite movie. Yeah. She's so obsessed. And, yeah. And you watch it, and you each time you watch it, you realize it's even more brilliant than you thought. It, it is brilliant. Yeah. And he's brilliant. Yeah. And, I, yeah. you know, it's interesting because we live in this weird time where before you could separate kind of the artist from the art. And well, if you were to cancel every artist for throughout history, for their offline behavior horrible. or their behavior in horrible. real life. I mean, yeah. Picasso horrible. had a string of people who killed themselves behind right. him. Right. <laughs> no, all, I mean, it's easier to find. Uh, I mean, most of them did horrible things. Oh, yeah. 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 No, it's 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 just you just can't look at it. I'm not way. justifying it, but I do right. think that there's a, the, that um, what, you know, I had um, Mitchell Sunderland come on and he was he's great. He got canceled, actually, because he was working. It's a long story. I don't even know if I'm allowed to tell it, but he you can Google <laughs> his name and find out what happened to him. Yeah. And he got canceled. But he was saying he thought that art in the Trump era would yeah. be much better. Yeah. And he's like, it's so boring. Uh -huh. He's so disappointed. Yeah. He's just so yeah. disappointed in that. Yeah. And he's like, God, the resistance is just like insufferable and boring. <laughs> I thought the art would be so much better. And it's right. not. And right. he's and he's making an interesting comment on how no, he was hoping it would be more exciting. Funny. But he said, suddenly these are the people who are canceling artists. Right. You know, he, know. he just is like, it's a weird upside down world where the people I thought would be re like resisting and pushing back are like them somehow more prudish. And it's very painful for me to see people on the left being in some way, censorious yes that's very painful for it's me. so it's just not the role of the left it shouldn't be and it has been in the past i mean that's what stalin was you know? <laughs> yes but it's just not right and um it's bizarro it's world very, for me yeah, i mean upsetting. i grew up with yeah. mm, you know the the right being the people who were yes raging against i remember when murphy brown was she had as a single mom and they were yeah. outraged yes, right, right. <laughs> that's the right that i know and right. madonna and all of it and right. banning rap and, all and of it. why you know 
look, people would say, well, why are there so many gay people in, in, in theater and all that? Mm -hmm. Because where else, 40 years ago, where else could you be gay right. and do what you want to do? Right. In other words, the arts was always open inclusive. to... Inclusive. It was inclusive. Yeah. It was open to people being different. Mm -hmm. And now there's this weird way in which it's it's closing in on itself. I know. It's so it's, it's a bizarre it's, experience to watch. It's yeah. like I, I feel like I sliding doored into another <laughs> upside down world. I know. Sometime in like 2015. And everything is up and down. And I know. I mean, I see you do a lot of um, stuff. You're very involved in the environmental yes. movement. Yeah. Preserving yeah. and conserving and... Well, it's climate change mm -hmm. more than the environment. I separate them. Oh, okay. Because I feel that, uh, although all of it's important, of course, mm -hmm. climate to me is an emergency. Yes. It's been an emergency. In fact, we may be done it's a, a I mean, lot of, some of I the scientists. I feel like we are. <laughs> some of the scientists. I <laughs> Not to be to cynical, but say it's already over and we just don't know it. Do you remember when Leo did that movie? The yeah, yeah the eleventh hour. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was like, Leo, I, I, I think we're too late for this. I went to one of the screenings <laughs> in Venice and yeah. I felt like uh, I was like, I think we already. And Leo is a guy who lives like he knows that it's too late. You yes, know, it's exactly. like he'll say yeah, yeah. like, oh, it's the end of the world. And I'm like, yeah, yeah I've never seen a guy more <laughs> often on yachts than you, Leo. <laughs> so um, no. I, no. I appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to judge. Eat, drink and be merry. Yeah. You know. Yeah. No, I got into it a long time ago. And in fact, I, through some weird fluke, testified in front of a congressional committee in 2005 oh okay because i had a manifesto that i wrote in 2005 saying that we needed a world war ii style mobilization mm -hmm. against climate that that was the only way we were going to defeat it we were going to and, defeat the climate <laughs> well defeat the change yes you know and um they all looked at me like i was out of my fucking mind mm -hmm. even the by the way i was sitting there next to like gore's people who were like total middle of the road well we should do this little bit of this and this and they looked at me like i was nuts but weren't they were kind of on board with this no they were not on board at that time with the kind of changes that we actually need to make uh, although people do not understand what the changes are are I mean, your kids active or are they kind of they are well they're upset yeah <laughs> they're not politically active yeah uh but they are very very upset about the state of the world are you vegan no. No. Okay. No. I hear that's you know vegetarian. a change you no. can make. No. I mean, I I'm trying to move toward being vegetarian, but for my health. Yes. You know. Yeah. The whole farming part of it is. There's so just, much. There's so much. It feels you know, overwhelming. But it. But the thing is, there is a way we can do this. It's very doable. That this is the weird thing is that World War II was hard. Climate is not that hard. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, it's not mm -hmm. that hard. And all this bullshit about what people think that it's going to kill jobs or we have to live differently. Most of that's crap. Mm -hmm. You know, the truth is most of the climate problem in America could be solved through free market forces. I agree. And, um, and I'm sorry, but the Republicans have just stopped it for years. They've mm -hmm. just stopped it because that was just against their whole, Ethos. they just didn't want to look at the world that way. But the truth is, you know, there are 100 million buildings in America. Mm -hmm. You know, every, there's an owner for every one of those buildings. That owner of every one of those 100 million buildings could save money tomorrow if they put solar on their roof. Mm -hmm. So why shouldn't they put solar on their roof if they could save money tomorrow? Mm -hmm. There's a disconnect in the messaging mm -hmm. because people do not understand, especially businesses should understand that, Saving money is the same thing as making money. Because right. Because your bottom line is the same. Right. You know? And so, you know, the energy revolution will come when literally millions of people realize I can start saving money tomorrow if I do this. It mm -hmm. won't cost me any money up front and I will start saving money tomorrow. Why don't I do this? That's the revolution. And most of that will be driven by private investment. Right. And financing. All you need is... You need a little bit of help from the government. You need some tax credits and that sort of thing. But right. most of that will be driven by the private sector. And it will be huge. I just read yesterday, there was an article that I saw that they found the 
after 40 years of trying to figure out what was making solar slightly inefficient, they yeah. I think they figured out they think they figured out what it is. Yeah, there's some new thing. That's right. I read about which that. is exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a whole thing. I mean, I could go into this forever, but the big bottleneck right now has to do with public utilities mm. because the public utilities in America are all corporations that have to make a profit. Mm -hmm. There are regulated monopolies mm -hmm. in each area, mm -hmm. but they're still supposed to make a profit. And if there's too much solar, they don't make profit anymore. Right. So the utilities are actually against having too much solar mm. because then they're going to have to invest. We have to redo our grid completely. There's a million things we have to do. Right. And we have to spend a lot of money. It's infrastructure that's the week. Bottle, that's, <laughs> it's infrastructure. Yeah. But by the way, one of the big things I talk about is there's a big difference between investment and cost. Mm. Investment means you put money in something and you're going to get money back. Mm -hmm. Cost means you're throwing away your money. Mm -hmm. And so I like to say, for instance, you know, the automobile revolution cost trillions of dollars. Right. But it expanded the economy a hundred times over. Mm -hmm. But it was a very expensive having everybody having cars in America was unbelievably expensive. Mm -hmm. But that actually expanded our economy. Mm -hmm. So just because things cost money doesn't mean it's going to hurt us. It could actually help us. The right. computer revolution completely expanded our economy. Mm -hmm. You know, but how many trillions of dollars have been spent on computers? Right. So you can't just look at costs. You have to right. say what is that cost going to do and in the case of of energy, it's going to do exactly what computers and automobiles did. It's going to expand the economy. Right. And I, this is what I hold against the Republicans because it's just been their doctrine for years now that this is a bad idea. They know it's actually not a bad idea. They, for whatever reason, they're against this. The truth is it's been clear for many years that moving toward renewable energy is a huge win. And everybody. and again, when you look at the numbers, actually, most young Republicans and conservatives uh, agree with this. Yeah. yeah. And there's yeah. a lot of there's a young Republican. He hates the messaging. Yeah. And my friend is working with him and yeah. he can't stand the whole conservatives don't care about the climate or the environment. Right, right. And most young Republicans disagree with that messaging. And so he's yeah. working yeah. on a, a whole That's approach That's to... Changing. So I think yeah, that young, it's changing, even yeah, as we speak, it's mm -hmm. changing. Yeah, I think it's yeah. not just the left, and it, it right, is right. the younger conservatives. I feel like right. are are because they also do see it from exactly what you're saying, the free market perspective of right. practically this also makes sense. By the way, my brother who lives in Philadelphia sent me a thing that he got from the Republican Party in Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, sort of attacking the Green New Deal, which, mm -hmm. by the way, I think is a ridiculous thing. I can talk <laughs> about why. Okay. But saying that the Republican approach to climate is much better, private investment, free market, blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking at that, I'm going, this is a remarkable document mm -hmm. because they're saying we should be fighting climate change. Right. For the last 10 years, they've been saying there is no such thing and we're not going to fight it. Mm -hmm. So this was a huge change. And that's what you're talking about. It's mm -hmm. happening right now. We're, we are finally getting a, an agreement in this country that we have to move. On right. This. And if we argue about how to do it, that's fine. That's a fine argument to have. Because in the end, most of it's going to be private anyway. Right. So. And why... In a nutshell, do you think the Green New Deal is... is, is oh, the Green New Deal... I can't just it's, leave my listeners being like, okay. why? What does he think? Okay. The Green New Deal is very problematic because it's filled with language that is the language of the extreme left in America, which is social justice warrior language. Mm -hmm. And basically it's tying fighting climate change to quote unquote social justice, mm -hmm. saying things like, you know, uh, indigenous communities must be in charge of whatever's done on their land and and vulnerable communities must be in charge of what's done in their communities. Mm -hmm. And it's not that that's wrong or right. Mm -hmm. It's language that speaks to a particular left-wing sensibility mm -hmm. that basically says the only way to fight climate change is to be a socialist. Right. And what I kept tweeting over and over again is rising seas don't care what your po politics are. Right. You know, and that... It is so 
and by the way, the 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 look, the Green New Deal was just a uh, I forget what it was, a, a declaration, mm -hmm. you know, but it was very short on actual things you would do to actually change climate or CO2, that sort of thing, and had a lot more stuff about you have to have guaranteed jobs for everybody. You have to have all these things that is really part of a left-wing socialist agenda right? that shouldn't be part of fighting climate. Right. The thing about fighting climate is it is inherently going to help Everyone. vulnerable communities. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah definitely. Because, because definitely. It, it's going to create 20 million jobs, and those jobs are going to be in manufacturing and installation. Right. Those are blue-collar jobs mm -hmm. that have to be in America. Mm -hmm. So it's inherently going to create economic justice anyway. Right. You know, so to, you know, to have this sort of language that makes it so that it 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 seems like it you have to approach it from one point of view only i think hurts the 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 conversation about it i feel like this is all across the board on the left too you know i think that that you could say that that there's a lot there's this really great show and they leaned into marketing it as you know representation matters which i absolutely think it does but yeah. this show is just great uh -huh. and it's called Vita and it's and it's um, I don't know that and then it's um, yeah. nobody does and everybody yeah. it's an amazing show on stars right and the story is incredible and I'm not a Latin American right. and I what or a Mexican American and I right. didn't but I still related to the sisters and the having a disconnect from your mom and right. story matters too yeah. you know yes, of course. and so when of you course. I saw and I think so many people because I tweeted it and I saw some of the comments and everyone's like I don't need this shoved down my throat no thanks and I was like, they marketed this and it alienated people. Yeah. And yeah. In, instead of being, and I understand that representation matters, but if you had marketed this just as the story that it was, sure. it might not, you might not have pushed viewers or potential viewers away Yeah. just because they're like, I, I don't need to be scolded. Thanks. Yes. I mean, I think, look, I'm a Democrat, lifelong Democrat. You know, I've been working on messaging for Democrats for the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Democrats are often their own worst enemies. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize how some of the things they say are heard by the rest of people in America. Right. <laughs> things that don't need to be said. It is the bubble effect. Yeah, it's the bubble effect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and yes, Democrats don't realize the extent to which they've become judgmental scolds, mm -hmm. telling people how to think, how to act what they should eat, you know, uh, you know, a million things that are none of their business. Right. And that they don't need to be concerned with. Right. And, and then it gets confused with the things that are really important. Right. right? The most important thing right now in America, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. is the disparity in income between the mm -hmm. top mm -hmm. and everybody else. That is destroying our country. I mean, absolutely destroying our country. most of the it seems like the kind of billionaires of the world are very concerned about this, too, because yes, you'll see yeah, them talking yeah, yeah. and uh, it seems like they're aware that generally when there's economic disparity such as there is now, yeah. it creates revolutions well, this is, <laughs> all throughout history. Right. This is my it's so funny. It's like people ask me what my politics are. I usually say I'm a liberal libertarian. Oh, funny. And. What does that mean? Okay, the difference between me and a and a real libertarian is we both agree that there's a social compact. We just disagree on how you define that social compact. Okay, and the way I look at it is that you know we do live as a uh, as, as an organism. In other words, American society is an organism. Of course, and the you know. The, the sort of analogy I use is what they always say about a bottle of wine, you know, that what happens in a bottle of wine is the bacteria are eating the sugar in the grapes and they're shitting out alcohol. Uh-huh. And eventually there's enough alcohol and it kills the bacteria. Right. And they die. <laughs> right. Okay. So the same thing's going to happen here, that if you have an economy that is so toxic for most of the people eventually it will destroy the entire economy and the country even for the people who are benefiting right, right now right so and that's what you're saying the billionaires understand that right and i think it's time for everybody you know you know it's not enough to say i'm a libertarian and i believe in freedom and i should be free to do what i want to do as long as it doesn't impinge on 
the person next to me and and I don't want to be anything demanded of me that you know that that I don't agree to I can understand that philosophy but if the culture you're living in is dying because of that then you have to look at it in a different way mm. but you can still hold on to libertarian concepts which i think are deeply important that's where free speech comes from right you know i don't want people telling me what to do right i don't want the government you know it's real to me it's really interesting that basically people on the left and people on the right both want government to do things that the other side doesn't want government to do i know it is and, interesting and they each go well what do you mean you know it's like i don't want that i i don't want to impinge on freedom but of course they want to impinge on freedom everybody wants to impinge on freedom and the truth is we can't have complete freedom that's why we live in a civilization right you know, we're just arguing about how we give up some of our freedoms so, right. that, so that we can survive mm -hmm. and we have to come to some agreement about this or we're going to be in deep shit yeah so well i asked the same two questions of everyone i know you have to go okay what is your biggest defect of character that you have to work against on in life or on a daily basis or oh man uh shame 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 wow yeah. we have that in common Sh shame has been a very very difficult demon for me mm. in my life and uh i think it's kept me from being in some way able to really experience my life as it was happening i think i'm much better about it now than when i was younger but i but i think that that shame has been really toxic for me that's interesting yeah and what is your greatest asset? <laughs> my greatest asset, I would have to say my greatest asset is my, my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say that I realized a few years ago that everything I understand about the world came to me when I was 16 years old. <laughs> I, I was never smarter than when I was 16 years old. How I was that smart then, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But basically, not that much has changed about how I view almost everything. And I had just amazing insights then. But it's the one part of me that I always felt I could depend on mm -hmm. in situations I didn't think I was good looking. I didn't think I was this or that. I wasn't a good athlete, whatever. But... I knew I was smart and you know and it's been sort of a a journey to sort of discover what that means what it means to be smart because there's so many different forms of being smart right. you know there are people who understand math and there are people there's emotional intelligence and blah 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 so you know I think there's an endless journey of self discovery or discovery of the world mm -hmm. that I'm down for and always have been wow well I look forward to more of your work that will probably influence the rest of my life. Oh, thank And you. thank you so much. We'll have to have you back. I would love to just hear more about everything. And thank you for making time and coming by. And thank you. This has been amazing. This is fun. Yeah. Thank you. So fun. Do you, do you, where can people find you? Where can people find yeah, you? Yeah, online. On Twitter. <laughs> not, not your house Twitter. or anything. <laughs> I don't have a website. So okay. just Twitter. Okay. M, M. Herskovitz. Okay. There you go. Find him there, guys. Thank you. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. <sighs> now I will scream infinitely into the mic. And for so, my final act, I'm so, I mean, we are losing it. The, I, can't, I can't with the gender I, stuff. I'm I can't sorry. either. I, I can't. can't. I just. And I'm not because even. Because it's going, it's, it's. It's so crazy. And you're a voice of reason. You know, you are somebody that keeps me from going totally down the freaking rabbit hole of red pillness. Right. But to me, it's just like it's starting to become like it's just it's not logical. It's just not logical in my it, it doesn't make it. I don't understand. And I've had I have trans friends. In yeah. the program. Yeah. Women who have saved my life. And anyone who go, you know, like. Go trans, be yes, whatever go you want to be. You want to be. I fully support your decision to do whatever you want to do with your body. But what's funny. Be, be whoever you are. This rant might seem like it's coming out of nowhere. But I was just talking to my friend who was getting 
piled on in a Facebook group for quote unquote suggesting only women menstruate. And this is where you the this is where I want to take the Democrats and put their head in a toilet bowl and hold them in wa- underwater and, and be like, "This is why you will lose <laughs> the next like, election. You guys are gonna lose." And they and and they cannot see the connection. Why? And it it feels like gaslighting. Yeah, it feels like you. What are you talking about? It's, that was like the article that recently came out in uh, uh, in my one of my former places I used to write for that was saying oh, not only women can have abortions. It's like you guys, you guys, uh, we speak in generalizations all the time. But just stop with just that. Stop. Shit. It's just like it, we speak in generalizations all the time. You are making people hate you. Yeah. You are like and, crazy. and then accusing them of transphobia. It's 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 this crazy it's cycle. It's insane. And this is the thing. On my good I, I push back, I see the craziness on the right. You know, there's just tons of gaslighting coming from that camp. And there and and I'm like, okay, that's that's dangerous. And yet for some reason, this stuff on the left. I turn around and look at it and the uh, I don't know what it is about the gender stuff. It like viscerally affects me. I think it's also we've talked about this. It's also because it's such a small percentage of the population that is actually trans. You're a bigot for saying this, by the way. OK, well, but see, that's <laughs> crazy to me because that's that's, that's a statistical fact. Doesn't matter. So if that makes me a bigot, like then we have larger problems if if we're not allowed to have these conversations anymore without accusing one another of bigotry. Like I am trying to understand what is going on and the fact that saying something like that would someone will accuse me of being a bigot for saying that like that's not helpful. How are you no. helping the conversation in making me understand what you're actually trying to say? And it's just so I don't understand that. Like there are so many problems in the world and in the country <laughs> right now. It's I just know. like it, it and this is we're like just preoccupied with our vaginas and penises. Yeah, it's, it's so weird. It's so it's strange. just sex and race. The, well, it's interesting, too, because there's so much that's illogical about it that I just and I, I will speak to my trans friends. And what's also interesting is like everything in the world now behind closed doors, people will say what something completely different than what they'll say. In public. in public yeah and it's true even with people that i'm on panels with in the media or that i'll have discussions with the minute you stop recording it's like oh i don't actually believe that i know they're crazy like what are you, what are you is doing my- yeah way to fucking pour gasoline on the fire but it does it's because they're afraid they're afraid you know it's all about the dollar and they don't want to alienate their audience but one of the questions i have is Okay, if gender and sex and uh, gender is a social construct, I will give them that because Lord knows there's plenty of stuff that gets influenced and uh, I'm sure that nature, nurture, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't even want to get into a conversation about how much nature and force encourages nurture, whatever. That's all true. What I don't understand is the sex is a social construct. And if so... Who cares? Why do you need to take hormones and transition? Right. Why? Okay. If by if if there's no difference between boys and girls, why do you need to take hormones? Why do you need to <laughs> like, be? Why do you need to become a woman or why a man? Do you feel or, like you're in the wrong body. Right. That doesn't, doesn't make sense. sense. It's it's illogical. It, it doesn't makes make sense me. To me. I, it makes me. It, it's it is thing. gaslighting. You're like, wait, what are you talking about? And this whole thing with <laughs> the guy in me. Canada and the waxing the balls. Oh my god. And like, uh, the, See, and that's the thing. Parker Malloy, who absolutely fucking hates me and thinks I'm a Nazi, but we will have civil conversations behind closed doors. She's she's trans and she has been very public about saying this guy is a predator Uh and there will. And this is what I hate is that there's always going to be one bad person that finds a loophole in the system. I'm sure in this case there will be more and more. But this was kind of the the it's the logical expression of this kind of intersectionality Mm -hmm. where you're it's now a human rights violation 
to not wax this guy's balls. Right. I mean, what it, we live in. You could not write that. This is like end of days shit. (laughs) Yeah. And you and I were saying this when we were walking home. You know, it feels a little bit more end of daisy. L.A. in particular. There's just so many homeless people and they're everybody's losing it. And when we went to go pick up food, there were like three people with cardboard box signs. And it's like 150 degrees. and, (laughs) And there's a guy screaming in the middle of traffic. And it feels very... This like is unhinged. The, the last of the time yeah. before the zombies rise. I was like, it feels. I just feel like I'm living in a pre prequel to the apocalypse. Mm-hmm. I've always kind of felt this my whole life, really. And this kind of insanity, where you look around and and you know that like you and I were talking about that movie that you want to watch, the Big Hack. Yeah, the great the hack great or hack or something. And how the Russians are essentially using psychological warfare against us uh-huh. to 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 manipulate, manipulate and us. divide us, uh-huh. and how easy it really is, and how well they're doing it. <laughs> it's not hard, no. And I just I my my only defense really is is to lean into the absurdity of uh-huh. it and laugh at it and because at it. I do. There are times where it feels. It's crazy. It feels Trump it is president. Feels like Men are women an and women. Are, yeah, it's it's I understand. I know I cannot imagine trying to raise kids in this. I I have so much compassion for any parents because I feel insane as an waters. adult. Yeah. So I can't imagine what how do you offer your children any 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 kind of guidance guidance or anything other than just Support. trying to be a decent human being and be intellectually honest which right. even that is increasingly to be harder, harder. And harder to come by yeah because you can't and and how do you trust a resource you know i comment on things all the time and it's like 90 percent of the stuff is probably a 4chan hoax mm-hmm. and it's just so eh. i hope that walk-ins welcome is you know we talk about politics on here and stuff comes up because it has infected everything and it's in everything it's in everything Mm -hmm. it has become entertainment and this is what's so dangerous and it was also predicted Mm -hmm. by books like amusing ourselves to death and mediated years Years ago ago. i mean amusing ourselves to death was written in the 80s and that was about tv that wasn't about this shit which is all of it on crack I, I keep coming back to, I mean, that Kira Davis podcast really stuck in my brain and that idea of st- extending grace, extending grace, yeah. trying to come back to that. And I, I want to like, I want to understand things I don't understand, but don't try and tell me that up is down and down is up and that the sky is red. Well, then too, it's like, okay, so you're going to demand that I say that men can menstruate too, but then that blurs the lines of like all the shit that women have been fighting for. Right. No, men can't get their periods. Yeah. And I hate them for it. And I'm not going to sit here and start saying <laughs> that they can because they freaking can't. And they can't, and they don't know what it's like as I sit here with cramps. <laughs> yeah. They don't know. They don't know. And they never will. We just, it, there's been such a far swing. It's like, can we come back to a little bit more <laughs> of like sanity in our discussions? Because you can take offense at everything. You can parse someone's words and turn it into anything you want it to be these days and figure out a way that it's offensive to somebody. And when did offensive become such a, a like criminal offense? <laughs> you know, like when did offending someone's delicate sensibilities becomes something that you get burned at the stake for. It's, I mean, the the gender stuff is insane. I'm so grateful for my parody account to keep me in check and laughing. The greatest thing. Well, see, now it's like we're at 11 minutes on this check-in. I'm like, should we do the parody account as a separate thing? Yeah. Separate discussion? Yeah. Because we might have to go... We might want to do that on Patreon too. That's fine. Yeah, but no, your your Twitter too is. It's been fun to watch the, these last few days. Actually, it's been a lot of fun. In you're just, I think the refusal to take 
it seriously and the ability to laugh at it all is one of the most important things. I refuse to take any of in it seriously. Life. It it helps it just helps get through the the craziness when you can just laugh at it and be like, "Oh my god. People, we've lost our fucking minds." We have. It's sad. It's so sad. I mean, I understand why if you're if you were already crazy, why you'd be in the middle of the street screaming. If you're not laughing at it, it I'm will crush you there. to death. Yeah, it will. Like, it will crush your soul. And you know, you and I were talking about how it, I really respect these people who are just like con- r- rigorously fact checking and constantly push it. I'm like, God, someone's got to Someone's got to do this. Right. And there are people on on both all sides in the middle reason uh, on the right and left who are really diligently trying to hold the line of sanity. Yeah. And I I see these people and they do do this work like daily. And I God bless you. It's not my role. No, your role is to help people laugh at it, because I feel like if we can't laugh at it, we're doomed. We're doomed. And I, it, it's, it's my happy place. Yeah, I can't, I can't take it too seriously. It's not good for my mental health. No. It's part of the reason that I've talked about this before. I had to kind of come center was I can't be in resentment forever. Mm-hmm. I have to get, so part of moving out of resentment is constantly th- not taking anything too seriously, not taking myself too seriously, not taking life too seriously, fighting for things that I think but at this point it's like I don't want to be fighting all day long no and it's such a weird it's almost like there's a virtual civil war going on and then you log off and everything's totally normal it is freaking bizarre but the world. cracks are starting to appear I feel like yeah. that's what we're feeling well, especially think- in LA it's it's much easier to see kind of on the ground well I think you see it m- more so too in places like Portland, mm-hmm. like the where you see these little flare ups of the Proud Boys and Antifa, they're the extreme wings of this online civil war being expressed in real life. Mm-hmm. So they are the like virtual civil war coming to life. It's just the the very extreme wings. But yeah, it's starting to I'm terrified for 2020, but I'm also kind of invigorated. It's going to be. Well, we're all becoming adrenaline junkies yeah. too, because especially people like me who are addicted to Twitter and are in the culture wars. Mm-hmm. There's, the, I get a rush out of just all of it being so insane and hilarious and so fast paced. Mm-hmm. And to think that I'm not getting some kind of dopamine hit out of it would be deluding myself. I clearly am, mm-hmm. but I'm going off in August. Social media in August. Feel free. Does this mean I have to do your account again? Your yep. Twitter. Fuck. You just <laughs> only have to post the you only have to post the podcast. The podcast. Yeah. Okay. I can do that. I've done it before. I mean, or I can do it once a week. Mm-hmm. Oh, it doesn't have to be so pure. So pure is the Lenten fast. Yes, God is not involved. Maybe I'll go on once every Thursday and just stay on all day. Mm-hmm. We'll work out the rules. And keep you posted. Anyone who cares. <laughs> yeah, no one cares. No one even emailed us. Send us your questions at Walkins Welcome Questions. Or just thoughts Gmail. and comments. Thoughts, comments. Is that our actual email address? Yes, yes. Walkins Welcome Questions at gmail.com. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Calm and Ritual. Just a reminder, check out the Calm app and use your walk-ins welcome listener discount of 25% at calm.com slash walk-in. That's C-A-L-M dot C-O-M slash W-A-L-K-I-N. And it includes unlimited access to all of their content. So get on that. They are the best. Ritual is the obsessively researched vitamin for women. Better health doesn't happen overnight, and right now Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Fill in the gaps of your diet with Essential for Women, a small step that helps support a healthy foundation for your body. Visit ritual.com slash walk-in to start your ritual today. That's 10% off during your first three months at ritual.com slash walk-in. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life. 
help you get out of your own way and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank Ricochet, our composer Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest one. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>